Hello and welcome to the Wise Guys Podcast. I'm John Tortorelli with my co-host Brandon Capazello. Justin Ray could not make it with us today. And it's maybe not a coincidence, PC. You know, earlier in the week, J. Ray told us, can the Jaguars win this game versus the Chargers? Yes. Will they? No. Now last night, I watched a Jaguars team have five turnovers and a single half of football. The closest thing to it was Ben Roethlisberger versus the Browns in 2020. But there's always that aura with the Los Angeles Chargers. It's Minnesota Vikings-like where it's never over until it's over. Oh, man. Brandon, what happened last night? What happened? I mean, what happened was... The Chargers were on the opposite side of the third biggest, um, uh, what is it, lead get, giving up uh, the biggest lead in uh, NFL history or playoff history, 27-0. Uh, I think it was like middle, uh, no, late into the uh, second quarter. Uh, then the Jags were able to score a touchdown before half. But it, it was, I mean, first off, let's start the first half. What a first half by the Chargers, right? I mean, get five takeaways, you get four interceptions, uh, and then the one muff punt, I don't know what you would just a very unlucky play. The the punt just happens to bounce off a Jaguars helmet and the Chargers recover. And, and then on the on the Jaguar side of it, I mean I, I wrote it down here. So the the first interception we all know was on the second play of the game. Uh Unfortunate. Joey Bosa made a hell of a play, batted the ball up, and then Drew Tranquil uh, was able to pick it off. He was right place, right time. The second one came on fourth down, where I personally thought Doug Peterson was uh, pressing a little bit. I didn't think you needed to go for it. Um, in that situation, I would have kicked the field goal. Mm. Uh, but he went for it, and T-Law got pressured. You'll go ahead. On that one play specifically, I know what you're talking about. I felt like t should have thrown it short of the sticks to ETN, who we had open underneath. I feel like Travis is good enough after the catch to get the first down there. So that's true. I agree with you. But I also think Travis made the wrong read. Yeah, I mean, at the last second, he was getting pressure in his face. He threw it to Zay Jones. And my thoughts on that play, I, I tweeted out, I, I thought Zay Jones gave up on the play. I thought he was basically looking for a foul. Regardless if you got fouled or not, you can't give up on the play because – what happened happened and you can't let that happen because you're gonna you get it if you don't get the flag interception there uh then the third one was uh i mean that one was just a great play by asante samuel who had shout out to asante samuel jr had a hell of a day three interceptions real chip off the old block asante samuel senior was a very good uh at catching the ball uh he just made a great play read it perfectly right place right time T Law never saw him. The and drag the, route you're talking about, right? Yeah, the drag route. Yep, yep, yep. Uh zone coverage. And then on the fourth one, this one was on T Law. I mean, you can't this one I give full blame to you. He forced it. Uh he was he was locked on. Uh, I forget who he threw it to. It might have been Kirk, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um he he forced it down the middle. Never and and Zay Jones was wide open on a drag route. I uh, never even looked at Zay Jones, was just locked, and he, he forced it, and then Asante Samuel made another hell of a catch. Uh, so, and, and then the unlucky special teams uh, punt that we talked about earlier, it, it was just a first half of horror. It was a horror movie of, of a first half for the Jaguars. They were able to get a slimmer of hope, like I said, scoring that touchdown at the end of the half, but yeah, that, that was basically the first half. Uh, you, you know, it, it was a bad, bad start. <laughs> for the Jaguars, and then just kept piling on, piling on, piling on, and the Chargers were able to uh, take advantage of certain things. I tweeted at that point, this playoff game is an absolute horror show. I said coming to the, the week, this would be the best game of the wild card slate. And it became that. Mm -hmm. It became that. Mm -hmm. Because while we're going to talk a lot about Brand Staley in this matchup, the Chargers got 17 points off turnovers. And just three points in the second half. I was very disappointed in the Chargers team as a whole. No Mike Williams in this game, and that really hurt. They had only three wide receivers by the end. But 
Justin Herbert let us down as well in his playoff debut. I don't oh. think he played well enough down the stretch. Mm -hmm. And while Trevor Lawrence in the first half played as bad as he physically could have, the second half of this game, BC, was one of the best performances we have ever seen by Trevor. And it really does show that, that poise, why he was taken with the first overall pick in 2021. Mm -hmm. You look at the first half versus the second. 10 of 24, 77 yards, one touchdown, and four picks. 24 pass rating. Second half, 18 of 23, 211, three TDs, no interceptions, and 145 pass rating. Trevor absolutely diced up Brand Staley's defense. Mm -hmm. Now, there were a few different things in this game. Of course, missing wide receiver number two hurt, but the other element of it was Chargers miss a field goal down the stretch, and on that one muffed punt, they got the ball on the Jaguar six-yard line, and they didn't punch it in. Austin Eckler had two quick touchdowns in this game, but that one drive right there, I think if they score the TD and they don't settle for three points, game's out of reach. Too far, too deep for the Jaguars to make a comeback. But that Jaguars defense, man, they get a stop, they force a field goal, and then later in the game, the Chargers miss an easy 40-yarder. That, to me, was one of the biggest plays of this because at the end, while Trevor is playing out of his mind, mental lapses, man. Mental yeah. lapses for the Chargers. Mm -hmm. A Joey Bosa unsportsmanlike conduct penalty sets up the Jaguars in the goal line after scoring a touchdown when they're down by four points. So they could have kicked the PAT and made a three-point game. Yeah. But Doug Peterson in the second half, he was taking a lot of gambles. Mm -hmm. He went for multiple times in two-point, and in that instance specifically, to do a QB sneak with Trevor yeah. making a two-point game. That, four, that fourth and one, I think it was on the same drive, the fourth and one where they lined up... Uh... I forget what that formation is called. I think that was the last drive of the game where they had T the triple backs. The T formation, I think they call it. I think it's called. It's a, it's an old school. It's an old school. But yeah, yeah, with the three running backs, that was a hell of a play call. Because uh, I, I at the point I was like, because they it was a minute twenty eight, I believe, left in the game. They still had three timeouts, but it was fourth and one. And I was like, when he called the timeout, I was like, oh no. Uh, dude, because you got to play like if I don't get this, at least I have the three timeouts in my back pocket where I can maybe get one stop where they don't get a first down. I can get the ball back with however much time left. But now it's basically you don't get this. This is game because you can't stop the clock uh, mm. uh, too many times. But hell of a play call. Uh, looked like it was going to be quarterback sneak. Everybody came in towards the middle, handed it to Travis Etienne. He just he, he took off towards the uh, right sideline. Hell of a play call. In this game, yeah. over 100 yards in the ground, five and a half yards per carry. This is the end for Brand Staley. Yeah, uh, and I, I just want to. So, in the second half, the Chargers had four drives. Right, they punted twice, made a field goal, and missed a field goal, like you uh, uh, talked about. The Jags in, in the in the second half, four drives as well, but they scored on every drive. And they scored 24 in the second half. Uh, th this is the this is the first time in playoff history a team got five takeaways and lost. A Austin Eckler only six touches in the second half. Not not good enough. And, and this one in the second half, the Chargers had more incompletions nine than rush attempts eight. Oh my God. What and they called the party. What are we doing? They called the run on twenty four percent of their second half plays. It, it goes back to the Dale saying, "Run the clock." I mean, run the rock, milk the clock. And, and it, it's just, I, I love being aggressive, but also if you're going to be aggressive, and this goes on Justin Herbert, you got to make the right reads. Don't force it. You know, you got to, and, and you got to make the right play calls. You know, have a safety net and under now, uh, under, underneath a uh, flat route or or whatever. You know, just where he Hot can route. check it down, uh, check it down, and, instead of forcing it over the middle or something. You know, it's on both them, coaching staff and Herbert. And, and like you like you talked about, Brent Staley's got to go. He's got to. I mean, I thought he saved it. I think everybody thought he saved his job by getting into the playoffs. We all looked at it and said, okay, he's gonna, he's you know, he got into the playoffs. He saved his job, but nobody foresaw this happening. Like I think if he would have just lost a game, close game, I think he, he would probably would have saved his job. But this, twenty seven to zero, you 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 can't keep your job after this. I mean, it, it's just been bad. It's time for the Chargers to go out and try to get a Sean Payton or a Jim Harbaugh. 
Uh, I think the Chargers and the Cowboys are going to be – because we're going to wait until see what happens Monday night. But I think they're going to lose, and Mike McCarthy's going to have to go. So the Cowboys and the Chargers are going to be looked at as the two most prominent teams of uh, free agent head coaches to go there. And then, like you said, Justin Herbert, he's not absolved of any of the blame here. A 58% completion percentage, not good. That's terrible. Forty, A 45.9 QBR. He wasn't special. He wasn't. And, and, and I look at two two key plays. I think you talked about one earlier. In the first quarter on third and four, from the four-yard li- four line, he missed Carter throw, uh, th- uh, right in the middle, and he threw it at his feet. He basically he dirted the ball. It's a tough throw, but, I mean, if you're going to be special, you can fit in that window, and you just threw it right at the ground, and that that stopped it from – you went up 10-0 instead of 14-0. And then late in the uh, second quarter with 428 left, this one was the worst one. Yeah, Keenan Allen wide open, wide open. On third in, in third and goal, could have went up 24-0. Missed him real high, had to take a field goal. Uh, th- those are key plays in the game, key plays that you can look at that could have been touchdowns that you had to settle for field goals, and this game would have been out of reach for the, the Jags to to be able to, um, uh, uh, you know, make this comeback. So, Justin Herbert, Brandon Staley, Herbert's going to be able to stay, obviously, because Staley's going to take the brunt of this. But Herbert, <laughs> you're not absolved of any of this. You, you were not special on a night where a lot of people thought you were going to be special. Absolutely. A highly anticipated playoff debut. A couple of key things to dive into. The Jaguars lost a turnover battle 5-0. to zero. Mm-hmm. They were 2 of 10 on third down. <laughs> the Chargers 8 of 17, almost 50%. And you said before the Chargers were aggressive throwing the ball a lot in the second half. But they weren't aggressive. The average depth of target for Justin Herbert was as it has been all year nothing they went for it zero times on fourth down there were no two-point attempts to go for it meanwhile the jaguars playing from behind they were the aggressor they punched the chargers in the face again and again and again and the jaguars the jaguars the Mm -hmm. chargers absolutely flopped a sign of a terrible head coach is bad ocs and there's no doubt in my mind joe lombardi the chargers offensive coordinator, is he's not fit for justin herbert and while we can put a lot of the blame on Herbo, the Chargers are wasting the championship window with an unproven head coach for a third straight time. Since Tom Telesco, the Chargers general manager, is coming in 2013, he has hired Mike McCoy for Phillip Rivers, Anthony Lynn, and Brand Staley. It's funny, Telesco actually went to high school with Brian Dable in Western New York. Last offseason, they could have moved off of Brand Staley after one year, after an embarrassment losing to the Raiders in that winner go home game, they head on the Staley. You make the playoffs in spite of an injury late in the season, but you just had the third biggest choke job in the history of the playoffs. The biggest one, Brand, this is a fun fact, was actually a decade ago in Kansas City against the Indianapolis Colts, mm-hmm. where the Chiefs were up 28 to nothing. Andrew Luck in the third and fourth quarter came back to win that game. Mm-hmm. The Chiefs offensive coordinator at the time, Doug Peterson, first mm-hmm. year on the job. One decade later, he's on the other side of the story. I was impressed with Peterson in this game. The ability to keep Trevor Lawrence composed, second-year quarterback who was never supposed to be here, and now it looks like the Jaguars are going to Arrowhead next week, mm-hmm. barring an upset today with the Dolphins being the Bills they're playing right now, or better yet, the Ravens somehow stunning the Bengals. Yeah, uh, I was just looking at the Bills just went for it on fourth and three and looks like they did not complete it. So Dolphins are going to be taken over and a good yardage situation. But uh, I agree. I mean, the Chargers haven't had a good head coach since you said Marty, um, Marty, Sh- um, oh God, Schottenheimer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even him, he had his, uh, he had his faults where he can never really win the big one. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it, the Chargers have been disappointing. Um it's time for them to go get because you don't want to. I mean, listen, you don't want Justin Herbert to. Philip Rivers had a great career, but at the end of the day, he didn't get you know he didn't get over the hump. 
You don't want her to end up being that because then that's just a waste of talent. Mm-hmm. So you you got to go out and you got to splurge for Sean Payton or Jim Harbaugh. And you know what? Justin was on the episode. I think we talked about it last episode where he he had a kind of a problem with me, you know, putting Jim Harbaugh in the same conversation as a Sean Payton. I, I, he couldn't be more wrong. Couldn't be more wrong. Jim Harbaugh last seen in the NFL. Uh, I, well, actually, his last season, I think, was actually a, a bad season. I, th- I think he missed the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken. But before that, three straight NFC championship appearances, went to a Super Bowl, had made a great comeback, you know, conspiracy theories and all with the lights going out or whatever, made a great comeback. It, he He is a great NFL head coach. Co- college and uh, looking at his college and what he did in college is all fine and dandy. And you, you know, you can fault him for not winning the big one or whatever, but he kept Michigan in a high, uh, a prestigious look. He, you know, everybody still looked at Michigan as a, you know, someone that can be a, a, a threatened with, but he helped turn around a struggling program. That's what I'm saying. Like uh, at the end of the day, he, he helped turn it around just like he did with the 49ers. And while he didn't win the big one, he still showed that he can be there mm-hmm. and college and NFL are completely different. So I think he's more suited for the NFL. He had way more success in the NFL, even though he had some success in college, even before Michigan, you look at his Stanford days, albeit he had Andrew Luck, but still I believe in Jim Harbaugh. And I think that if he can go, you can't tell me that if Jim Harbaugh takes over the, the Cowboys or the Chargers, that Justin isn't going to be, especially the Chargers. If Jim Harbaugh is the head coach for the Chargers, he's going to be, you know, hyping up the Chargers to all hell and being like the Chargers are going to be threatening with the Chiefs. And I'll be right there with him because I believe in Jim Harbaugh. I think that he is a great head coach, and I think that he can turn around and help put teams over the hump. He's been to more conference championships than the Chargers. The- I call him the Chaguars for a second time. Jim Harbaugh has been in more conference championships in the Chargers since 1982. Yep. Three times they're having four seasons. The Chargers, they've only been to that situation twice since 82. So, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, going from an unproven head coach with a terrible offensive coordinator and um, just a, a struggling defense that had way higher expectations. Yeah. If Vic Fangio and Sean Payton or Jim Harbaugh and his staff, it'd be no-brainer. The Chargers are going to be in a much better situation. I feel like for them, it's just, you can't waste any more time. Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. Justin Herbert's going to his fourth season, and that rookie contract is the window. That window is quickly closing. You have no more time to waste. If you do, Tom, Kles- Tom Telesco is going to be out of his job. Oh. Now, speaking of jobs well done, I want to one, touch one thing. Quick. One thing. Trevor Lawrence is still undefeated on Saturdays, 34-0. That's pretty wild. High school. And I think college, actually NFL. Wait. Next week. We the 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 things haven't been announced yet, but it's gonna be interesting to see where the Chief if the Chiefs, because I believe it's gonna be Chiefs and Jaguars next week. So it'll be interesting if they play on Saturday. 34 0. I don't know. Speaking of winners, Brock Purdy, BC. Mm-hmm. Had himself a pretty special playoff debut. Four touchdowns, no turnovers, the one the turnover battle. And for a six straight start, the 49ers win. They keep their season alive. In this game, the Seahawks gave you a little bit of a scare in the first half. They finished Whoa. going to the second 17 to 14 after a rough Jimmy Ward penalty. And then after Jonathan Abram decided to ankle lock Debo Samuel, the 49ers won a crazy run in the second half. I feel like we're getting to a point with Brock Purdy where nothing's off the table for San Francisco. I know a lot of people are skeptical of Brock Purdy early on, but Kyle Shanahan was 9-29 and with his backup quarterbacks before Purdy came in, and he has won each and every single start. There's no doubt Brian Hoyer or Trey Lance and Nick Mullins, C.J. Beathard didn't have this plethora of talent, but I feel like we, we, over, we underlook how hard it is to play in the San Francisco offense. It's one of the thickest playbooks in football. And so for a rookie quarterback to come in and on the spot have to build chemistry with these weapons, all the while having Super Bowl expectations, Brock Purdy has more than lived up to the task. He's expe- exceeded our wildest expectations. This guy should have went undrafted. No one was even willing to take him in the first six, seven rounds of the draft. 
and right now we're watching him play clean football, making incredible plays. The guy's got a good enough arm. He's accurate. He's really quick in his decision-making. He hasn't wasted any time in the pocket. He does a really good job evading pressure. And for the San Francisco offense, that's all they need right now. And it's ridiculous to me to think, for a team that traded up to get a third overall pick, that the guy taking with the 262nd selection is the best man to lead San Francisco to a Super Bowl this season. And as a Steelers fan, I don't want the Niners to touch a Super Bowl ring this year. I don't want to see them get their six. But I have to be honest with you, oh, the Seahawks poked the bear yesterday. And right now with Brock Purdy, I think we're seeing the franchise quarterback slowly developing here in San Fran. Yeah, I mean, listen, he's doing a, a very good job in his role. Uh, I've always said, I've always said that, and I've always just said with the caveat that he's got the best offensive talent in football. I mean, everywhere you look, Debo, Brandon Ayuk, uh, even the unheralded receivers uh, can make those make some uh, pretty good plays here and there. George Kittle, Christian McCaffrey, I think Elijah Mitchell is healthy too. Yes. The offensive line is is very good. I mean, you got Trent Williams, the best tackle in football. Mike Lynch. It, it, it's just it, it's a plethora. It, it's a, it's a it, it's so much like toys. You don't know what the hell to do with them. Uh, so, a credit to Brock Purdy for being able to be successful with this, with what he's been handed. But again, you you still got to look at it with uh with with clear eyes and be like, he's got an insane amount of talent. Uh, and I, I give them credit for beating Seattle, but not too much credit. I mean, it's Seattle. They, they they were the seventh seed for a reason. They really shouldn't have been in the playoffs the way they played the second half uh, of the season. And they got swept for a reason. The 49ers swept them in the regular season for a reason. And I told you this game was probably going to get out of hand. It, it was able – the Seattle made it look, you know, good for the first half, leading 17-16, to 16, but – the 49ers just came out with a different energy in the second half and just put it on them, uh, scoring. They went on a 24 0 run. Uh, 25 0 run. 25, yeah, yeah sorry. After 25 the 17 14 start in the first. Yeah, and they got two turnovers and forced three three and outs. So, no. Forcing a three and out, one three and out, not three. You said Seattle should have never been here in the first place. And coming to the season, yeah, no one expected us, no one expected Seattle to go 9 9 and make the playoffs. Most people have them a top 10 pick. That being said, they made the playoffs in spite of an unearthly, a wild amount of injuries, and an enormous, almost infinite across both sides of the football in the second half of the season. And so for them, this season was a huge, and I mean huge, stamp of approval for Pete Carroll. Coming into the year, most of us thought Russell Wilson was right, and that the Seahawks were automatically not going to win that trade just because... The Broncos got themselves a Hall of Fame quarterback, and they're going to ride into Super Bowl expectations. The Broncos gave them the sixth overall pick, and the Seahawks were the ones to make the playoffs. Seattle made the playoffs, and the Broncos missed the playoffs. Seattle doubled the Broncos' win total. Geno Smith had a much better season than Russell Wilson. Mm hmm and while they were swept 3 nothing against the San Francisco 49ers, yeah, they lost the division to the best team in football. This game spoke a lot more to me about how good and how deadly this Niners offense and this Niners defense is than the Seahawks and just not them not being prepared. They were a playoff team. They had themselves a really good development with all those rookies coming in. Tariq Woolen established himself as an elite high-end cornerback. And all those other guys in the offense really doing a good job supporting Geno. DK Metcalf in this game, monster performance, 100 yards. I feel like for yeah. Seattle, man, they're in one of the best positions in football. You've got oh. two first-round picks. You've got some seconds. You have all these young rookies getting to their second season. And it's only a matter of time here before the offensive line really rounds down entirely into form. Right, here's, the, here's the thing, though. And like I said, I've given the respect to Geno Smith for this year. He had a great year, Okay. Uh, second half was a little rocky, but still, you got to give him credit. He put up a, a pretty damn good year, especially considering what he was for the past, what, eight, eight nine years or however long he played for. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you got to look at it and you got to say, no, I, I gave him comeback player of the year, so I don't want to hear that I didn't give him his respect. But at the end of the day, you got to look at it and you say, 
how far can Geno Smith really take us? And I, I think we all know the, the answer to that question. And it, it's not that far. Um, so you, you just laid out that they've, they're have they in a pretty damn good situation. I agree with you, except for, I hate to say it, but the quarterback. The quarterback's going to be the biggest question. You like the team, but the quarterback, he can do, can he replicate this again? Is this a one one year wonder? We don't know. And even if he does do it again, at the end of the day, you're not going to favor him over Seattle. I mean, uh, San Francisco. Uh, you're not going to favor him over um, uh, Philly probably next year. Dallas is going to retool. Uh, the Packers, I believe, are going to retool. You love the Lions. I love the Lions. The Vikings are still going to be there. And I think the Rams are going to retool and hopefully be back in contention next year. You're not going to take – Sean McVay news, yeah, man. Yeah, you're not going to – you're not going to take – you're not going to take Seattle over these guys. So are they are, – are they maybe a sleeper team in the Derek Carr sweepstakes? Do they maybe want to move up? Are they a big believer in in a, a, um, a Bryce Petty? Uh, Bryce, Young. Bryce Young. Bryce Young. Sorry. Yeah. I, I keep talking. <laughs> uh, Bryce Young. Um, you don't know. And so at the end of the day, I love Gino. I love the story. He's made a great comeback. I gave him comeback player of the year. But at the end of the day, you really got to evaluate this and look at it like how far can Gino really take us? And at the end of the day, it, it's not that far. It's probably wild card, if that. And I feel like it's a pretty good problem to have. Gino, in an age 32 season, was the most surprising player in football. That gives you the optionality to, maybe in the second round, take an upside play on Anthony Richardson out of Florida. Just some sort of young project player that can sit under the wings for a season, develops in Pete Carroll's offense, and by a year or two, maybe Geno's not the guy he was this season, but then you have a young up-and-coming quarterback that you took a flower on. And I think for yeah. the same... But but do you, uh, do you believe... So, I mean, I think if the Seattle Seahawks get a, a, a very good quarterback, I think they can be right there in a Super Bowl contention if they retool a couple of things here and there. So for me, it's just like you're taking a flyer on a player that's very unproven. Um, it's just, I, I don't know. It depends on what, what your goal is. And if your goal is to win a Super Bowl, which I believe every team's goal is at the beginning of the season, you really got to evaluate and look at it and say, you know, do I want to go get Bryce Young? You know, you've got the draft capital, I believe, to go get it. You just got an insane amount of draft capital from the uh, Russell Wilson trade. So you might be able to go make a move. The Bears aren't really probably in contention for a quarterback. So hell, make make a trade. Go get Derek Carr if you think Derek Carr is you know that much better than Geno Smith. I I I think Derek Carr is. I, I believe Derek Carr is better than Geno Smith, but I don't think he's he maybe gives you the same, uh, you know, chance uh, deeper in the playoffs because at the end of the day, it's you know, Derek Carr is is you know. Yeah, I've seen the Derek Carr rumors to Seattle flowing around. I wouldn't swap one 32-year-old quarterback for a 30-year-old. Mm -hmm. You asked what the goals for Seattle. It's getting younger under center probably and getting cheaper. I think it's Geno's earned the money, the $25 million a year. That's how good of a season he's had and how athletic he is. But overall, I do agree with you. You should get some sort of backup plan because Pete Carroll now, this is multiple quarterbacks he's won with. He's made the playoffs with different guys under center. I made a mistake before. The Seahawks are the fifth and 20th picks in the draft. And that gives you the flexibility to move into the top three. Maybe if it's not a Bryce Young, maybe they love Will Levis. Who knows? You know, they still have Drew Locke in the roster. I don't think Locke is going to be the, the QB2 next season. Overall for the Seahawks, I think they're probably... One of the best situations in football because of those draft picks coming in. And really for Geno Smith, man, I think he's going to have a quality season again next year. I don't think it was a fluke. I think he's learned way too much, and he has the perfect mindset to continue off of this strong season. I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna to see. Uh, but I, I think the NFC is going to be a little bit tougher next year. Um, uh, but on San Francisco's side, I saw a report, John, uh, from Ian Rappaport that apparently the 49ers would be would consider going to get Tom Brady next season. And I tweeted if the 49ers go get Tom Brady, they are going to be the pro prohibited favorites to win a Super Bowl. There will be talks about 17 and 0. And if that does happen, 
if he signs, I will instantly pick them to be my Super Bowl champions for next year. I would hope you would. I think you're still going to be a Brock Purdy next season too. I think you would too. I think, and I think Justin would too. I think you guys would come to the yes. I, I believe so. How are you going to – I mean, you just sat, sat here and told me that they are in real contention to win the Super Bowl this year. They're mm-hmm. going to have a very similar team, if not the same team, next year. Tom Brady's going to take a very cap-friendly uh, uh, hit. You're going to have Debo still. You're going to have Ayuk. You're going to have CMC, George Kittle, Trent Williams, uh, J- uh, Nick Bosa, all these – Fred Warner. You're going to have all these guys still. Yeah, and the All your Raiders are another team too. That's it's really eyeing up Tom Brady. I know they're a team, but like at the end of the day, I think if the choice came clear, I think uh, Brady would take the 49ers. Uh, it's a chance to play at home, the team that he's always wanted to play for, and I mean they give you the best shot. I'm, I'm dead. At, like I, I guarantee by if he signs with them, John, by preseason time, you would be on that bandwagon saying, okay, the, I, I can't like who won. Who wouldn't be on that bandwagon? That's what I'm saying. So uh, that's all I'm saying. So just agree. <laughs> don't don't try and be the negative Nancy. Just be like, uh, yeah, you, I, I do see exactly where you're coming from. It, it would be, it would be the prohibited favorites. There's a stat: Tom Brady is one playoff win away from having as many wins as any franchise, other than the Patriots in the playoffs. Yep. So if he goes to the NFC Championship this year, I think that he breaks the record, or he has to go to the Super Bowl. He's, I don't know. He has records. With all that being said, do you have anything else like that? Uh, no. Go um, Giants. That's what I have had. Yeah. With all that being said, I'll wrap up this emergency style podcast. We appreciate you watching, staying to the very end. If you want us to add something into our next episode, be sure to let us know in the comments down below. It's not a surprise, Jerry. We're going to make it with us. I don't blame him. As always, we'll see you next time. Peace. Stay have a great day.